welcome back to the Commercial Property Investor Podcast, and I'm your host, Jerry Alexander. This is a show where we aim to demystify strategies in the commercial property market and to give you more clarity on how this asset class can work for you. And as you know, during these shows, we talk about lots of different strategies, and we've done a mini series before about self storage. Well, I've been trying for a while to get Dean Booty on the show because I know Dean is a smart operator in this space and I really wanted to get the perspective of somebody that has started from um, from having no sites, is growing into multiple sites and has a great strategy for moving forward. So Dean, thank you very much for joining us on the show. Jerry, thank you so much for inviting me, buddy. It's, uh, it's an honour and a privilege, pal. I really appreciate it. And Dean, we'll talk later on, but you're also a prolific podcaster. So we'll talk about that later on as well. So I know I'm in good hands here. <laughs> I, I love my podcasting, Jerry. Absolutely love it. Brilliant. Okay, so let's talk about where you are right now, because what I want to do is just give people a bit of a context about the sites and locations that you have right now. And then we're going to go back to the start and then we'll go through the story and come out the other end and talk about where you think this market, this great um, storage industry is going in the future. So maybe you could just set the scene, Dean. What, what, how are things for you right now? What are you up to? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm really, really passionate about self-storage. I absolutely love it. It's um, it's given me a great life so far, and hopefully it'll continue. At the minute, we've got two sites. We've got one in Beverly, which is an outdoor purpose-built container site. Um, we've got 87 units there. And then we've now opened an indoor facility called Stormore, which has been open four years. And we've got close to 400 um, different units on there. So it's a big facility, 30,000 square foot. Um, and it's put a mezzanine in. So we've got 60,000 square foot. We can go out with a big car park and we're adding containers on there as well. So um, yeah, we're hoping hoping to open our third facility in August this year as well. So really, really excited. That's brilliant. I'm, I, I need to quickly ask you a question about Stormore. When you're inside, are you putting containers in or are you using a, a, a different system for building out and creating the small units? Yeah, so we're, we're putting metal indoors. Um, and so it's it's literally, it's not containers, it's individual rooms. So each one has a door. We put a lock on. The, every single one has individual alarmed rooms. So if somebody enters a room, then it alerts. It alerts to my phone. Um, and we have containers in the car park. So we have a bit of both, actually. Um, so we have ca- containers outside and then individual doors, units inside. Brilliant. All right. Well, we'll come back to that. So let, let's go back a bit to the start for your first site. And maybe even prior to that, I mean, why is it you ended up in self-storage? You love it now, but what, what actually got you into this? And of course, there'll be some scary moments there too. What, what actually um, was the, the trigger that made you actually step into the industry? Because, you know, it's not zero um, investment, is it? You've, there's a lot to do. So what was that trigger? What led you up to getting into storage, Dean? Yeah, the real honest answer is that I didn't know what else to do, Jerry. I, I had no <laughs> idea what to do with my life. Um, I, I The only thing I'd ever known during my early career was betting and gambling. I, I seemed to have a knack for it. I'd, I'd always been with my granddad's in betting shops, getting kicked out when I was five or six years old. I had a tipping service. I had... Um, I was manager at different different national firms, and then I eventually opened my own um, betting shop, which which did incredibly well. It was because I just seemed to know what the punter would would want, and I really really enjoyed it. But I could see that it was going online, and I knew that I didn't have the capital to to compete with the big boys, the Bet Three Six Fives, William Hills, Lab Brooks, etc. And so I knew I had to get out. Luckily for me, Corals came in with an offer that I couldn't refuse in two thousand and 12 well early 2012 and so i sold and then i i didn't know what to do for six months uh, i went on honeymoon in in may of 2012 and just saw self storages everywhere in america and i was just right there's got to be something in it and i'd looked at doing all sorts of different businesses and i didn't know what to do and so i started googling self storage in beverly and i realized hang about a minute there's no self storage in beverly and that was the end of my honeymoon i literally <laughs> started Googling containers, how to, you know, how to work self story. I knew nothing about it. And I was obsessed. I just be, quickly became obsessed and um, found a location in Beverly. And yeah, in December, 2012, we, we opened Beverly 24 hour self storage. And luckily, uh, I, do you know what? I, I know people, I've got so many different business friends who say, no, no, it's not luck. I, I'll be honest. A lot, a lot of my 
that where I am right now is because of luck. I mean, I lived in a town that had no self storage. That is very, very lucky. Uh, we opened, it quickly filled up because, uh, because it was, there was no other operators there. We then opened Stormore um, three or four years later. And again, it, it was more luck than judgment. I just found the location and we didn't, in Hull, there's not a lot of operators again. And so I was very, very lucky. And that's, that's filled up fairly nicely, but there, there is a barrier to entrance into self-storage and that's obviously the, the, the investment to start it. Yes, of course. Yeah. And going back to that time you were in, in America, was it Florida you were in? So I went to Las Vegas. I went to San Diego, San Francisco and Hawaii. Right. And I just, oh, wow, I just, yeah. I, I actually, funny story. Um, I, I actually, when I got to the, because we was hiring a car because we were doing a lot of driving. Um, my, my wife says she hates driving on motorways in England. And we got to where we were supposed to be hiring a car. And I'm like, um, oh, I, f- I forgot my driving license. And they would not obviously let me hire a car. And so my wife had to drive everywhere. She was not happy at all. Um, but it gave me the opportunity to look around. And that's where I kept seeing these self-storage facilities. They're everywhere, aren't they? Yeah. And so it was, do you know what? It was... Again, that was lucky because if I'd have been driving, I'd be more concentrated on the road. But I was playing my Tiger Woods golf on my iPad and, and looking at self storage facilities. It was it was fantastic. <laughs> Great honeymoon for you. <laughs> yeah, it was brilliant. Yeah, in Vegas, it was fantastic. <laughs> I do. I mean, I I've been um, to the states as well, and you, it is amazing, particularly in Florida. There are a number of self storage facilities, and they're all quite different. Some of them are full boat yards and they've got all sorts of stacking going on and that and other ones are just simply a row of lockups behind a chain fence you know it's quite quite st- extraordinary but if, it, over there it just seems that yeah everybody has a storage unit that's how how they live and you'll know the numbers what i mean what are the numbers over there compared with over here for self-storage in terms of you know when people say in the uk oh well you know there's quite a lot of self-storage now but actually when you look at the numbers compared with the us where are we at Oh, it's it's the the amount of growth that we've still got in the UK is absolutely huge. Um, it's uh, currently it's 0.7 per square, uh, it's 0.7 square foot per capita in the UK in av- average at the minute. It's 1.4 in London, but obviously that's more dense population. In America, it's 15 square foot per capita. And so it is absolutely bonkers. Don't get me wrong. I don't think that we'll ever get to that point where America is. But if you look at uh, Australia, it's three square foot per capita. And so we have got an awful lot of growth still to still to happen. And, Every and single year, supply... Um, the, the demand is outgrowing the supply every single year still because we've got we get an industry report every single year and the we just can't keep up with the demand. I, I like to future protect myself and at the minute if you open a self storage facility if you if you make sure that obviously you don't open up where there's ten surrounding you um, then you should do okay. It doesn't matter the location, um, but what uh, currently at the minute. But what I'm very very aware of and careful of that I don't want in ten years somebody to outposition me. Because then I'm I'm always thinking about my investment, how much that I'm potentially going to sell for, how much is a facility going to be worth, and so I've I've got to get fairly decent locations. Don't get me wrong, it it will work. I'm convinced it will work if you don't have a fantastic location, but I just for future proofing it, then I would rather have a pretty decent location. I speak quite regularly to people in America and they're all about, you have to have a, a roadside location now yeah. to make it work. The, the guys who opened up 10, 15 years ago would have opened up at the back of industrial estates and that would have been absolutely fine. Now they're probably struggling a little bit because of how competitive America's getting. I'm, I, we're nowhere near that point where you know, a self storage facility can't work at the back of an industrial um, site, but I just try to future proof myself but yeah for, for me i just think there's a, a fantastic opportunity in self-storage i really really do brilliant and that, thanks for those numbers it's just it's amazing isn't it when you think about the uk and the lack of land that we have because we've got you know this island and then you think about how spread out the two countries you just mentioned are and yet they've got such a high concentration of self-storage where they've got all this land and space the thing about location is quite interesting because we have We developed a site about 2009, yes, so 10 years ago. And that site was pretty much 100% full for most of the time up until about two or three years ago when it started sitting around about 95, 1995. We'd we'd usually have at least one unit vacant. Then we bought another site which had good roadside presence. And that site's 
had always historically been 100% full and since we've bought it, it's continued to be so, but it's also allowed us to cross sell the other site. So now our other site is 100% full because we've got that roadside position to get that it, those inquiry numbers. It's amazing, isn't it? And in the US, there's a lot more um, online sales as well, of course, and there are um, collating platforms, aren't there, in the US? And I know we have some in the UK, but I don't think they're quite as well populated as they are. Um, it's almost like an online broker, isn't it? In terms of how the operation changes from the UK to, to America, America, I, I did a debate at the FEDESA conference, the European conference, in front of 800 people. This guy uh, from America, uh, Travis Morrow, came on. Really nice guy, good-looking, suave, looks good in anything he wears. And there's me just, you know, my jeans and a, and a hoodie goes on stage. And he's saying about automation's the future. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I, I do believe it's the future, but I think we should give the customers what they want. If they want, like the supermarkets, automation, if they want it, and if they don't want it, then there's still there's people there to serve them. And obviously, because of coronavirus, the, the world has flip-flopped upside down, and it's accelerated the technology in the industry. Yeah. And later today, I'm actually having a call with somebody who's going to make my third facility manless. Uh, completely manless. Don't get me wrong, I'm massive on customer care because I feel like that if you can look after your customers, your customers will always look after you. I, I want my customers, um, past and present, to be walking, talking billboards for my for my company. And over 25% of my customers actually come from word of mouth, which we're very, very proud of. But I, I do think that we are leaning now towards uh, there's such an opportunity in the UK to, to really, it's, it's almost land grab, there's very, very few people doing automation in the UK. And that, that's what our third location is going to be. It's going to be a fully manless facility. When I say manless, obviously you still need to clean the units. So somebody needs to go in and clean the units. And we've, we've all, you, you will have somebody sat on a telephone, uh, but they won't be at the facility. They'll be in my other facility, Stormore, and people will be able to ring up and uh, will be able to answer any questions they have at another facility. So that there'll be nobody stationed there full time. Brilliant. I want to I want to touch on tech later on. Actually, so let's hold that thought. And also, it's not just um, it's it's the whole automation of customers as well, isn't it? Online and bringing new customers. And I just wanted to ask you, what what are the kind of sources? I'm sure you know the exact matrix, but what 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 are the what are the key sources of introduction for customers for you? I mean, we've talked there about roadside roadside signage location. Um, what else are the sort of in the top three for you for getting customers? Yeah, I, I absolutely love my numbers. Um, on my podcast, I literally give every single uh, number away, revenue, conversions, where we get our numbers. Um, I do a monthly podcast that tells you about exactly where my numbers come from. So 71% of our quotes come from come from Google because it's an, it's an intent. When somebody needs self-storage, it's an intent. So when you have an intent, then you go to Google, you ask the question. Um, but interestingly, only 40, it's around about 48, 49% of my move-ins come from Google. So yeah. it's it's almost like the quotes and as the customers who come from Google and as warmed up, the audience isn't as warmed up. So we, we've got a lower conversion rate with Google. Um, it might be a number of different reasons. Location, they might have just put Hull self-storage and they might be at the complete other end of Hull, which is quite a big city. So therefore, we're never going to get that customer. And so, yeah, we get 71% of our of our quotes come from Google and around about 48, 49% of our overall move-ins come from Google. Then our, our next biggest is um, it's the signs. And I, like I we, we was talking before, uh, we press record and you, you don't really know you can't read the label when you're stuck inside the jar. And so I've got a consultant as well. And he took me around my roundabout near me because um, it's a prominent location. He said, Dean, what do you see? I said, myself storage. He goes, no, no, Dean, what do you see? And I said, well, I see Aldi. I see, you know, little. And, and he's like, no, no. And he said, you haven't got, they've got massive signs. You've got this little bit, little sign. He said, you need to invest in signs. So sure enough, I spent two grand on signs and literally like clockwork, we get so many quotes coming from, from our signs because now we have a bigger roadside presence. And I, I, I'm always embarrassed about that because I should have known it, but sometimes you never, you can't see what you can't see. You know, you're too, in, you're too, um, you're too busy running the business to really see certain things. So yeah, and then it's, then it's word of mouth and we do some social media, um, but I'm in, I'm in a lot of other groups and masterminds and they, they all mention, oh yeah, Facebook advertisements, Facebook advertisements. Yeah, great, but it's got to be for the, for the correct product. And for us, we found that when we test Facebook ads that don't work 
um, just purely because it's, there's, there's got to be an intent. So you go search and you go looking for it. And if you come across a Facebook ad for self stories, don't get me wrong, we retarget. So we pixel everybody who comes to our site and then we retarget them to make sure that they're constantly seeing us for the next four weeks um, just just on, on Facebook. So we, we do retarget them on Facebook, but we, we found that much better than actually... Um, doing it to a cold audience just by location and then we have our blog which um we have about about one percent of quotes come from our blog and we we normally have um exactly like you we have a cross pollination from from beverly to hull because it's only seven miles away so when we can't fit somebody in beverly then we often send them to, to storm or to, to in hull and um that normally is bet- anywhere between six percent to ten percent of our overall movings come from from beverly 24. Yeah. So that's, I mean, for, there's some great stuff in there, right? So for, for me, I remember having a conversation with a national provider of, of business space. They had about 50 odd locations. And I remember him telling me of all the budget and everything they have for advertising and pulling in customers over many, many, many different units and spaces they had, the number one provide provider of leads was their signage. And, you know, and I, I really took that to heart. Yeah, that's just amazing. But it's, there's no, there isn't a silver bullet, is there? There's lots of different places where you get leads from. And as you say, it's good customer care and referrals. It's signage. It's online presence. It's maybe being a wee bit smart on how to do online presence, whether it's through Facebook or whatever. But it is a mix, isn't it? You're, you're not going to... Um, if you concentrate on one and the tap gets turned off or something changes, people aren't out in the cars or they're not on Google, whatever it is, then that can go. So you've really got to try and spread it out, haven't you? Yeah, and it's also just a little thing like um, at the estate agents, what we do is make sure that we personally know the estate agents and we don't want to go in and say, oh, please recommend it. We want to give them something fair. So we, we, we go in there and we give them Prosecco, we give them chocolates and just, just be nice people, just you know, say, look, if you if you ever want to recommend us, you know, just so you know where we are. And we're constantly showing up, you know, giving them gifts and stuff. And then, and we also, if you know your numbers and you, you know what you're prepared to pay for a, for a quote or a customer. Um, I, I know that every time the phone rings, every time we get a quote, it costs me on average 27 pound. So I've, I've got to let everybody know saying, look, every time that phone rings, we've got to really respect that customer because it's 27 pound, 27 pound. And so what we do is we have a referral program where if the estate agents would recommend us, then we'll come down and give them 50 pound. We'll have given them in vouchers or, or whatever. Yeah. And so they, they know that they're obviously people do stuff more when you give them something. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's about creating relationships as well. I, I don't think that, I don't think I'm anywhere near as successful as I want to be or anywhere near where I want to be yet. But a lot of, of my life has be, been from relationships with people. And I think that's often overlooked and just being nice people, genuine people and and going above and beyond. Like I, I literally write a thank you card to every single one of my customers um, to say thank you very much for, for choosing Storm or Self Storage. And I have a little postcard and I, I spend, uh, it's only about an hour, an hour and a half. And I sit there with a glass of wine on an evening and I, 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 have, a, I have a spreadsheet that pops up on my screen. And I, I, yeah, I just, I just write saying, thank you very much. Dear, dear Tom, thank you for choosing Storm or Self Storage. I hope everything's to your expectations. Kind regards, Dean, director. And I put a couple of smiley faces in there. And just, just some little touch points. I think that, Sometimes we've got to do things that don't scale. I know people will be probably listening thinking, well, that doesn't scale. What happens when you get 10 sites? What happens when you get 20 sites? That's great because that means that you're the difference. You you are doing something extra that other people won't do. That's how you stand out. And I got it from um, Bonjuro because uh, I don't know if you know Bonjuro. It's a video application where um, I absolutely love it. It's fantastic. So every time a customer moves in as well, um, or, or we get a quote, we've got it now where it logs up to our Bonjuro and... Um, what we do is we send them a video message saying, thank you so much for requesting the quote with Stormore. We'll be in touch very, and we, and we make sure we, we angle it. And so it's, so people can, can see how nice our facility is. Um, and so we've already got a touch point. So it's subconscious behavior. We know that because they can see our face, we're no longer just a faceless company. So every single quote, I'm, we, we make sure that we send them a 15 second or 30 second video message to say, um, thank you very much for choosing uh, to, to a quote with us. Um, we'll be in touch in the next, you know, so, so long just to follow up with you because we've already spoke to them at this point. Um, yeah. And and that that has helped our conversion rates massively. I was going to ask, what are your conversion rates, Dean? So our conversion rates, what we aim for, um, so 
conversions from quotes to reservations, um, we aim for thirty percent, which is which is big wow. in the yeah, that's, that's good. huge yeah. in the industry. Um, and then quotes to move-ins because not every reservation turns up because the the reserve a unit, and then for whatever reason they might change their mind, the sale might fall through. They don't always always turn up. So it's and then we have another another metrics called um, quotes to to move-ins, and we we aim for twenty five percent. The last quarter we hit twenty four percent. Uh, with our movings, which was really good because we had our best ever quarter because of coronavirus is actually, I, I hate saying this because my sisters are in the wedding industry and they've, they've, oh, they're just, they're in a world of pain all the time, but we've, we've seen that it's accelerated, accelerated our growth as, as coronavirus. Um, and so, yeah, we hit 24% quotes to, to movings in the, in the last quarter and we was around about 28% for reservations, which I was really happy with because we had more quotes than we, we ever have done in quarter four. But just, just going back to Bonjoro really quickly, they actually sent me a personal note saying, thank you for choosing us. And don't get me wrong, it's scribble on this little bit of card. And I was like, that is amazing. We've got to do that. So that's why <laughs> I put myself out because I, I remember the feeling that it gave me and I thought, I'm never going to leave Bonjour. And now I'm talking about Bonjoro now. And and so I, I think them little touch points that you can, if you can make the customer feel respected, then that, that goes a long way. And what does it cost me? An hour and a half of my time every single month or an hour of my time just to write. And I, I sit there drinking a bit of wine anyway, watching a football match. So it's, it's great. I'm having a beer. It's, so it's, it doesn't it don't take a lot to stand out. And I just want to, I always, and I get, I get the staff as well to, I don't like calling them staff either. I get the guys who work with me to, to email me once a week to say how they went the extra mile for, for a customer. And that now is making sure they're consciously looking right, what can we do more for a customer? And then, so they email me a story, what they do every single week to, to stand out and uh, how they've gone the extra mile for a customer. And then obviously that's another touch point with a customer and hopefully that they'll they'll remember that. And we want them to feel obliged that if anybody mentions sell stories, they almost feel that they owe us something to say, no, you must go to store more, you must go. And, and again, I think that reviews as well are so, so big in in this sort of sector and industry. And I'm really proud by how many reviews we've got. We've, we, we've, we've been open. Um, there's a national firm um, just across the other side of town. They've been open 10 years longer than us. And we've got now more Google reviews than them, which is, which is something that we really just a little stupid thing. Like I'm, re I'm really proud of it because I think like that so many businesses overlook the fundamentals and the fundamentals of the customers. And so you can, we, we look at all these KPIs and, you know, the revenues and, but if, if we focus on the customers and I know it's a long game, but that will always, always play out. And so that, that's what, that's what we try to do to make sure that we go above and beyond. Got it. Got the extra mile. Brilliant, Dean. There's so many threads we could go down there, oh, sorry. and I'm tempted to go down some of them, but I'm going to try and resist, right? Because <laughs> there's a whole lot of content there. That's brilliant, though. Thanks for sharing all that. I'm, I'm just conscious that some of the people listening to this, are not in self storage. They're thinking, or they may even not be in commercial property yet, and they're thinking about how to get started. So, if if they were um, considering either a putting self storage as part of their offering, or b going fully into self storage, what are some of the tips you would give looking back on somebody starting out in this industry, so that they can maybe make their their operation more successful, or give themselves a better chance of filling it and making it a good success. Yeah, well, two two things. I'll tell you where I personally um, tripped myself up, and it was it was something silly, really. But uh, first, I'll I'll go. I, I listened to your self storage uh, podcast that you did, and I thought that your advice was absolutely fantastic because there's, there's another self storage company that's opening up in my town, and what they've done is they've bought fifty containers straight away, and yeah. they've they've had them on site for three months now, and it still says coming soon because there's still another. 14 more that they can fit in. I'm like, what, what is wrong with you? Just open the doors now, get customers in. And you, you don't have to have every single container there ready for the people. You, you can have one container at a time. There's, there's, a, there's some competition that we've got in Hull and they're an automated container site. Uh, I've just, I've forgotten the name actually now. Um, but what they do is they've got a big, big site and very, very simple. They lease the land. They might spend, I don't know, 20,000 pound on the land. And first of all, they had one container. Then they had two containers. Then they had three containers. Exactly what you said. You don't have to buy all the containers straight away. And so that, that for me is the number, number one tip. 
um, that I, I think that people should do is, is you don't have, if, if you're going for a container site, then you don't have to have every single container there ready. You only have to have enough to service the customers that you've, you've got right there and then. Um, one thing that, that I would strongly recommend that everybody look at, it's not just the setup cost because indoor store storage is a barrier to entry. We've spent um, nearly a million pound on our indoor store storage facility. And don't, you, you don't have to go to the, Oh, I, I always start with the end in mind because I know I want to sell it to a big national firm. So we've got the same software that they use. We see using the same people to, to put in the, all the structure and all the rooms. Um, we're, we're doing individual lounge rooms. Um, you've got pin code access. We've, we've, we've really gone down the route to make sure that this can compete with, with the big boys. One thing that I did overlook is my cash flow. how much cash flow it would take to run. And I remember um, sat there one day and I had a 60,000 pound bill and I had literally no money to pay it. That was, that was because phase, phase three was coming and um, I, I didn't realize how much cash flow, because first of all, you've got a big empty building. It's not like outdoor containers. You've got a big empty building. I was been 150,000 pound a year rent on it. And then we had the rates and then we had the staffing costs and we had the electric, all the other associated costs with it. And we only had one customer, then we had five customers, then we had six customers, seven. It, and don't get me wrong, the revenue was going up every single month, but was it's 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 called leasing up now. Now I, I know all these terminology. You're in lease up phase where you you're literally your expenses are more than the revenue. Don't get me wrong. Eventually, you will obviously keep acquiring customers and gaining customers, and you'll then eventually get to that critical point where you're taking more than you're spending. But then we had loans to pay back. We had fifteen thousand pound a month on loans to pay back. And I was like, oh my God, this is absolutely eating into all my money. And I did a personal guarantee with a bank. And and then we 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 because we do it in sections, you don't you don't fit out a big 30,000 square foot building first of all, you do it in sections. And so after section one was done, I was like, oh, we, we, we're beating our projections. Yeah, cash flow is a bit tight, but it's okay. We're beating our projections, what we expected to be in at the minute. Um, so I went to the bank and the bank says, Oh no, no, um, because I wanted to do phase two. And they said to me, oh, we need a we need a period of consolidation. I was like, what do you mean a period of consolidation? I, I can't have a period of consolidation. This is my expenses right now, and this is how much I'm taking. And so I need to open phase two because we're turning customers away. Oh, no, sorry, Dean. Uh, the, the land has, uh, has changed now. The, and so we, we can't actually lend you the money um, and, until two years' time. And, I, and so I never foresaw that coming I because the bank was always on board with exactly what was doing. We showed them exactly everything was doing. And we said that, listen, phase phase two will be this time, phase three, phase four. And they was on board with it. And I said, listen, what you've done to me is you've almost tied a noose around my neck and you've kicked away the wood because now I can't possibly with only phase one because there might have been only 70 units there available to rent. I, I need at least 150 units to break even. Break so even. Yeah, so you're saying a period of consolidation. There's no period of consolidation for me because we're turning away, we're turning away customers. So for me, it's to know your numbers. And if anybody's ever interested in self storage, then they can they can always get in contact with me because I've got two fantastic bits of spreadsheets now that I've devised over the years that are absolutely phenomenal. And the the auto populate it tells you exactly how much money you need. I can I can do you know what? I'll, I'll, Jerry? I'll show you the spreadsheet. I'll give it to you and I'll, I'll a little demonstration on it, and you can give it away to awesome. you, to people. That'd be brilliant. Well, we're gonna have show notes, aren't we? So there'll be places there for people to get things. But yeah, that'd be awesome. I'm the first in the queue for that one, Dean. <laughs> 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 that sounds like a big project yeah and it wasn't your first one when you did the first one um was that a little bit less scary in terms of the numbers and and you you've leased that ground haven't you the first project as opposed to going and buying and putting all that capital and tents of you know money into the ground and developing it and that is an outdoor storage facility so did you manage to reduce your risk on that one or at least the capital you had to put out put out at the start did you for instance finance containers did you buy them outright how did yeah. you go about the first one I, I was very lucky because um we had a bit of money from from a betting shop left over so I, I i think i sold it for around about well exactly three hundred forty-five thousand. we sold the betting shop for and i even though i went to vegas on my honeymoon we didn't we didn't spend much money in and so, so we, we we was very lucky we still had that to, to invest in in the 
in the self storage facility. But again, um, you, you you live and learn as you go on because I I went to I remember after a two years we was full and I thought right I want to I want to understand this industry more. I want to be able to to um, educate myself. So I went to a sales uh, seminar and I was really proud because I thought, oh, we're doing fantastic. And uh, we're going around the room asking the occupancy of sites and you know how well you're doing. And everyone was going oh, 70%, 80%. And then they got to, I was like, oh, I'm 100%. <laughs> and they got to me and they said, uh, so what, what's your percentage? And I said, oh, we're 100% full and we've got a waiting list. And he goes, what? And I thought, I thought he meant it in a good way. And he goes, are you, are you, you're far too cheap. What, what are you doing? I said, uh, what, what do you mean we're too cheap? I, and basically he's saying that, listen, if you're 100% full, then what you need to do, you need to up your prices because you yeah. always need um, you always need a little bit of turnover to, to make sure that, that, um, that so, I mean, we, we, at the time we was, we was taking, it was just 66,000 pounds a year we was taking from, from the facility. Um, fast forward two, three years, we're now turning over 135,000 from that, from that facility because as soon as we got to a certain percentage full, we would increase our prices. And it's all about revenue management, understanding revenue management for self-storage. And I wasn't aware of, of, of that whatsoever. So I just thought it was great to be 100% full when really, in, in essence, um, I was doing myself a disservice because I was clearly too cheap because we had a waiting list. We had people waiting to come in and I was turning people away. So what, what ideally what you want to be is around 90% full. So then you've got that continuous you've always got a self storage facility you've always got a unit spare we're we're currently 92% full at beverly and uh, we're now taking more money than we've we've ever taken when we was 100% full so it's just Amazing. little things little things that you learn along the way that how would you, how would you possibly know um so yeah it was a, it was a steep learning curve because i was going from an industry where from gambling and betting where i thought i knew a great deal um, to, to where you literally know you know nothing. And and the, the thing is, the more you educate yourself, the more you learn, you, you know you don't know anything. I was talking, I interviewed someone called Anne Ballard, the hat lady, who is big in America. She's one of the best operators that I know. And I, I thought I, I you know, was pretty good at cell storage. And she starts asking me questions like, I don't know, I don't know the answer to <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it just you you realize that you know what? As soon as you feel like you know everything, then then you you, you definitely need to educate yourself <laughs> some more because you you definitely do. Brilliant. Okay, I'm going to ask two quick questions. Actually, I'm interested to know on your sites what is the split between commercial customers and domestic customers? Because you spoke there a little bit about working with estate agents, and it would just be interesting just to know what that mix is for you. Yeah, I, I, know, I know that we don't do as well as you on this because I know that listening to your podcast that you you do quite well with business customers. Business customers are, are more valuable to, to us and we can definitely improve on, on our split. At the minute, it's 14%, 14 point something percent is business customers compared to um, 86% as residential, as, as personal. So on those residential ones, what's their average length of stay? So the average length of stay is 10 months at the minute, but because our facility is still growing, it's only been open four years, we expect that to increase. At Beverly, our average, because we've been open eight years at Beverly, our average length of stay is 1.6 years. However, um, the problem there is that you do have some outliers because we've got people who have been there for, for seven years, and yes. then you've got people who have only been there for a week or two. So, yeah, and the, the average, the... The cost for our customer as well is we we get twelve hundred and nine pound per customer per moving. So that that's how much our customers is worth. We don't have a split for businesses. What a business is worth to to a personal, um, to a normal residential. But we we know overall it's twelve hundred and nine pound. So if we're spending a hundred pound on Google Ads per per uh, per moving, which we normally do, it's around about one hundred and six pound we pay Google for for our movings. We know obviously that we're we're okay there. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. There's great numbers. I, I mean, I think the reason why we're a bit better on commercial is because our facilities are sitting with commercial buildings. So we have a, a cross sell there. We have customers coming in. They might take a two person office, but they need some a space for all their stuff. Yeah, but they can have it on the same site. So it saves them going and getting an industrial unit to put all their stuff in and an office. They can do it a lot cheaper with us and just do that mix. I think that's probably why we've got a better, um, better number there. Um, but what just, is your split, Jerry? So I, I would say, I mean, depends on which site. What uh, The site we've just bought is quite close to one of our buildings, but because we didn't manage it before, um, 
we didn't really have a control over who was coming in. But interestingly, that site there, there's at least 60% of commercial customers. Wow. Our, our other site, um, where there's about 40 containers, that one, I don't know the exact numbers right now, but I would say that domestic customers out of those 40 containers is probably about six at the most. Yeah. The rest of them are either tenants that have a container or two, or they are externals who have a container with us just and they're commercial. So it, it but you know, it's a wee bit, it's a wee bit different, but Dean, we haven't gone in, we, you know, we haven't gone all in like you have, you, you know, it's part of a mix for us. It's not ever being a single strategy. So, you know, our, our locations are not um, in really good public locations. As I said to you earlier, and one of them is in, in a much better location than we had before, but our domestic inquiries there are definitely higher as, we're, as we've taken that site on. But thankfully there's a cohort of commercial customers that have been in there for quite a long time. But interestingly, one of the things that was pretty obvious when taking that, that site over was that they were not charging enough because they were 100% full for years with a waiting list, as you, as you mentioned. And quite often enough, I'm talking to people about getting into commercial property or into storage. I think one of the things that people overlook is actually looking at competitors and whether they are actually a good acquisition. Because even if you're paying a normal industry multiple for the site, you understand by knowing the numbers and the profit and loss that actually this potential for the site is way higher. And of course, that's why when um, individuals sell out, whether it's, and, and forgive me, but whether it's a betting shop or um, a restaurant or a hotel or a self-storage site and a larger company buys it, it's because they know they can get a better margin by improving the way it works, by really working on the profit and loss. So I think, you know, people that are looking at getting in the industry really should look at some of those out of the way sites that they don't quite find so well on Google. They maybe don't quite operate so well, but they seem to be 100% full. The mom and pop type yeah. facilities is definitely a, 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 an area. So let's just talk about growth for a moment and, and the future. And Dean, you're obviously really excited about this industry and you've, you've invested massively in that, develop, that site you're talking about, the second site. You, you've mentioned a third site. What, what, what's your um, what's your goals over the next five years, Dean? What are you trying to do in this industry? And you, you're going to sit and enjoy the income, or have you got some other plans? Yeah, no. Do you know what? It's, it's not I, it's not about the money for me, really. I, I I just I love it. I love I love getting up. I love my goals. I love my ambition. And yeah, we storm on now. We've we've passed that critical point now where. We're paying down debt very, very quickly. Um, one of our one of our big loans, uh, six thousand pound a month that we pay back, that ends in March. So I don't know when this episode goes out, but yeah, we'll we'll, we'll be debt free very, very soon. And you, you could just sit there with with that, but it's not it's it's not about the money for me. It's about um, I just I really enjoyed the buzz, the getting up, um, the the aims, my goals. Um, in terms of acquisitions, it's funny you mentioned that because we was actually. Um, my strategy has changed only in the last six months. And it, it, again, it's because I spoke to someone on the podcast and he's got a fully automated site in Ireland. And I'm actually speaking to him later today. And he's he's telling me his numbers, he's getting a 42% return cash on cash, which is incredible. But not only a 42% return, that self-storage facility will sell between eight and 12 times multiple, which is just incredible. So you're getting a cash on cash return but you're getting that multiple when you sell. And he was telling me, because he comes from the data and he's all about the data. And I, I didn't know whether, whether everybody was ready for manless facilities, but he's proving that, that we are in this industry. And obviously with coronavirus hitting, uh, the more and more I speak to people in America, um, I've, I've learned that we are ready to go down that direction. So before that, I was sending out letters to other self-storage facilities because most in independent mum and pops self-storage facilities aren't run correctly or have no revenue management in place. They don't increase the prices. Um, they don't charge insurance. Um, so or that's a, I'll tell you an example of, of one. I won't tell you where it is, but we, we, we was going to buy it. We agreed a deal in principle and we just got to the point with solicitors and it's, it's when I, I started looking down another route and I felt incredibly bad for, for this for this guy because I know he wanted to sell. And I, I knew that my friend actually wanted to come into the industry. He wanted to come into self-storage. And uh, so he's now taken over that acquisition because we're just changing tax a little bit. And that facility is 94% full. He doesn't charge any insurance 
at all. He's never done a price increase. And at the minute, it only makes maybe £10,000 a year. But straight away, I know with the correct revenue management, you can turn that around to making £60,000 per year. It's only a small site, so you probably get only maybe four to six times multiple. Uh, but straight away, you, you, you've already increased the value by you know six figures of that facility within within a year. Um, and so for me, for the insurance, uh, just, just really quickly on revenue, we have 15% of our overall revenue comes from insurance. And it's it's correct for the for the customer and it's correct for you because you'd never insure a Ferrari for a mini's price. And if anything, God forbid, happens like a fire or anything, um, which it, it has happened and it will happen again in self-storage facilities, you've, you've got to make sure that the individuals who are storing with you are correctly insured. Um, just to protect them but also it works for us as well because you've you've got all that revenue coming in we we earn um close to six figures a year just to just from insurance and it, it's something that i i share and i'm quite open with because i think it's important to be transparent for anybody wanting to come in the industry so i share all my numbers um so in terms of where i want to be in the future uh, we've we've got another opening in uh, down Clough Road in, in Hull, which is next to a Starbucks, which I'm really, really excited about. I'm passionate about it. It's only a small site, um, around about 10,000 square foot, but it's got a lovely uh, courtyard, which we can put containers on or purpose-built units, whichever direction we want to go. And it's going to be a manless facility. I want to run that for another six months before I I, I really go into, I, I just want to proof of concept. I know we'll it's been test proven. That out. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's been proven in America. I know it's been proven in Ireland. I know, I know it's been proven in Leeds as well. I've been to a site that's fully manless in Leeds, but I've never done it. And I know that I'm going to make mistakes. And so I want to test that one out first of all, uh, after I can see the numbers after, because I'm, I'm, I'm very numbers driven. When I see the numbers, then I'll know that if it works or not. And so we've got another potential site just outside Bradford as well, which again is next to a Starbucks. <laughs> We're not purposely doing this, but it's a high traffic road and it'd be absolutely perfect for us. And so in the next five years, I would hope to have uh, between 10 or 15, 15 units at the minute with person, we've, we've got, um, we're, we've, we've got some individuals who who actually are backing us with with funding, so we're very very lucky on that on that score. Um, so it depends on on when and if um, those those uh, those funds run out at all. But um, at the minute, yeah, we're we're being backed by private individuals, and uh, I, you know we we might we might open it up of, of some sort of fund or something. I, I don't know. We're, we're looking down that route of how we're going to get to the next level. But at the minute we, we can, the expansion plans, uh, Stormall will pay for, for any other expansions and Bethley's obviously doing, doing well as well. So, so at the minute we're, we're covered. And uh, so in six months time, then when I get proof of concept, then I'll be going hopefully all in. And by the end of, by the end of this year, I do want to have found another location and, and started work on it. So by the end of this, this year, we want four. And by the end of and end of next year, hopefully we'll have seven or eight underway. And uh, yeah, just, just keep, just keep expanding like that. But obviously we've got to be very, very careful and make sure that, because somebody in a rush, never been in a rush to do anything, because if, you, if you're in a rush, then you know, you, you'll, you'll make mistakes. And so you've got to make sure it's the correct location. And sometimes as painful as it is standing still, is the best decision that you can make and walking away from a, de a decision or a deal, which I feel like that, especially me, because I, I, I don't like waiting and I've just got to be held back a little bit. So that's why I've, I've got, I've got mentors and stuff that hold me back and say, Whoa, come on, Dean, you're going too fast. Just, just look at it, look at the numbers. And so, yeah, so sometimes standing still is, uh, is moving forward ultimately. It sounds like you've got the perfect balance there, Dean, of enthusiasm and excitement about the industry and um, the numbers the numbers, having the, the discipline to go through your numbers consistently and to really know them. So I don't think money and funding is going to be an issue for you with that combination. I really yeah, don't. I've just got to be careful because I, even, even then I can feel myself getting excited. I'm, I'm literally, when I was talking to you, I was arguing with myself thinking, yeah, but then you've got to be careful. You can't expect too <laughs> I can, I've, got, I've got the devil. I've got the, the angel on my shoulder saying. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Listen, I, I do remember going to a show in the US and one of the things that just... I found outstanding about that market over there was the multiples they apply. Yeah. The multiples for selling out self storage over there is nuts because institutional investors are in that market, aren't they? Yeah. So I remember we we're looking at yield rates of five and six percent regularly on sales of self storage facilities, and I was like, man, that is crazy. And and there you're talking about multiples of four or five potentially. I know that one, the one we bought recently, I think the multiple was about three and a half that we managed to, 
to pay for that one. But there's two things, isn't there? There's the expectation of those multiples to increase, which is going to really help. And that's something that you don't have control of, but that's something that hopefully over time is going to happen looking at other markets. And then, of course, the other aspect is increasing the revenue by all the things you've been talking about and some of the other tactics there about um, increasing your visibility, increasing your customer numbers and increasing it, therefore, in time, your service quality and your, your, your costs or your income. So one of them you can really very much control. One of them, hopefully that market's going to grow and, and people, institutional investors will start coming in. But of course, you need scale for that, don't you? And that's exactly what you were talking about. I have one other question I know that people are going to be asking me um, or asking in the background here is, what is the typical price that you're finding in your market for a container space? So I'm assuming you're the same as us. 20-foot containers really is, is, the, you know, is the main one. Um, what, what sort of price point are you managing to achieve of, of buying the containers are actually no, of actually renting them out yes yeah, so, so we're we're again we're that we're one of the dearest around i, I know that obviously uh, after listening to your podcast um we charge a minimum of five thousand pound insurance um currently the the minimum that you can buy a uh, rent a storage a, a container from us is 44 pound a week including that yeah so it's uh it's it's expensive but we we do buy the best containers to make sure that the the, the we used to spray them with graphotherm, but because we use Willbox now, and I know you've you've interviewed. Yeah, I've heard I've, and I heard that that conversation you had, yeah. And he, yeah. he was very much about well, ventilation now is yeah a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. and so we, we spend a little bit more on a container um, because of coronavirus and what's happening with China and stuff. But that we're spending a little bit more on containers now. Um, it's two thousand three hundred and fifty pound that we're we're getting a container for at the minute. Yeah. Where before we used to get them delivered for eighteen hundred pound, and so this is yeah. this is killing me. But uh, but yeah, it's it is it is a good return that we're we're getting for for containers at the minute. And there's there's also there's there's so many different places as well because you don't have to just do a twenty foot container. You can do although they are the most popular. Um, you can do you can have a container sliced and diced, and so you can have a um, a, a 20 foot container split into three and have three like, roughly 50 square foot units so there's, there's other things you can do there's a there's a container site in in leeds that do that very very well uh, they've just won the container site of the year um and they actually use 20 foot containers and they have somebody comes in and just separates them into into different sizes so what, yeah. whatever size that they potentially need at the time so yeah we're getting a roundabout um, we, we, we're getting good money for our for our containers just purely because of the supply and demand. We're, we're completely full at the minute with our containers, and so we're probably again we're probably too probably too cheap then. But yeah, we, we're getting around. We're getting that that sort of price. Yeah, it's nuts. I mean, when you look at the numbers, just the numbers on the container, and you're looking at it from an investment point of view, and you think, well, I'm spending eighteen hundred. Let's call it two grand on a container. I appreciate prices have changed at the moment, but two grand on a container. And I'm going to be ringing in a thousand, twelve hundred, fifteen hundred pounds, whatever it is, a year on income. Yeah, the return on the investment in the container is quite substantial. But there are, of course, other costs, not least the land, but also technology. And I want to just, as a last piece here, because I'm, I'm conscious of time, Dean, is just to talk about maybe some of the things that are changing in the industry. And we've mentioned a couple of times there about trying to go for automated sites, but also what are some of the key tools? and uh, things that you could suggest that newbies could maybe look at in terms of either software, apps, hardware on site. Is there any tips you could give there? You just think, do you know what? If I was starting again, I would definitely invest in that because it's made a big difference to running costs or whatever. And obviously, as time goes on, these apps are always developing all the time, aren't they? And the ability to pay online and all that sort of stuff. So is there any things there, maybe two or three uh, things you could think of that, that would, um, <laughs> you're smiling there, dude. I just, I've, I've just got a memory of when I first started. Uh, Jerry, I did it all with a spreadsheet and I literally had a spreadsheet where I had to ring somebody for money. And so I used to look down, when I used to go in my office, yeah. I used to look down and think, it. okay, it's a fourth team today. I, I need to ring, you know, Mr. Smith or something for payment. And then tomorrow I need to ring Mrs. Jones. And I'm like, oh man, I can't believe that I used to do it like that. But but obviously you live and learn. You don't really know what's out there. Yeah, we, we use a system called Space Manager. And again, we use that software because it's not the cheapest, but it's probably the best. Um, and we use them because all the big boys use them. So when we come to sell eventually in 10, 15 years, um, they can integrate it very, very easily. They can have a look at the system. They know what they're looking for, know where the reports are. 
And so we use Space Manager and Space Manager can connect up to direct debits. Again, when we first opened, we couldn't use direct debits. We use standing orders, which if, if a big tip that I would say you've, you've got to use direct debits because um, or, or card payments, um, because if you want to increase prices, a standing order, it's, it might be it's for... It's a nightmare, isn't it? We did yeah. exactly that. We, we started with standing orders, but now we're on cards. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I, I know that with cards, you've got to pay a processing fee, but it is so worth it just purely because then when you increase the price, you don't have to get Mrs. Jones to come in. And the idea with self-storage is the reason why people stay longer than they ever expect is because they've actually got to physically do something to, to stop for payments. They've got to take the stuff out of the unit. And most people just can't be bothered. They like the extra space in the new house and don't really know where their old ornaments are going to go, but I don't really want to chuck them away. And if you're ringing them and saying, can you come down? It it becomes it becomes a hassle to come down anyway. So they might as well take the stuff out. And so you you want to keep it as as easy as possible for them to keep paying you. So yeah, I would definitely use Space Manager. And the great thing with Space Manager is that you can you can add reports. We we pay Space Manager. We we pay them £168 a month for for our licenses. And what we do as well, we if we if if my staff ever do something more than once, um, I, I automate it because I'm a great believer in, in trying to save time. And so we request Space Manager to, to build a report. So for example, the certain KPIs that I look for every single day that I ask the guys to send me across it at the end of end of the end of the day. And it takes them maybe 15, 20 minutes because I'm a I'm a bugger for my KPIs. I look I, I I, I, I have too many. I, I know I do. <laughs> and so it takes 15, 20 minutes. And uh, so then you can get Space Manager to um to build a report for you exactly what you want because then it saves a guy. It cost me eight hundred pounds to to build this report, but now my KPIs are sent over to me um, every single day automatically. As soon as they log off, it automatically fills what I need and sends it across to me. Um, price increases. We've automated all the price increases as well. It's it was something that was probably taking two hours a month, but if you do it every single month, automate it. It costs us four hundred pound, but then it takes it off the off a guy's plate that don't have to do it. And uh, with with these reports as well, the great thing is because because I've built these reports for us, we can then give them away to other self-storage facility owners and operators because you can just plug it into their system. So every time I get a new report, I just mention it on the podcast saying, listen, if anybody wants this report, this is the report that I use for for my KPIs and my measurements. Just send us an email and uh, I'll get them to send send you the report so yeah the, the great thing is you can just plug it in you can you can plug anything that i develop you can plug into another person's user um you can plug it into their system their software as well so yeah i, I would personally use space manager because it saves it saves an ungodly amount of time and effort and energy that's brilliant what about um customer interface so when you've got a customer discovering you and they go through that process is there very much uh a person to person activity going on there, or do you have a little bit of automation there about them signing up and everything else online? Yes. Yeah, so, so what I try, I try to think of it like a funnel. Um, so first of all, uh, on Google, I'm trying to get the right balls to click on me. And then on the homepage where everything is designed to, to make sure that they request a quote. And it's interesting in the storage industry because, um, people, there's a big debate going on. I mean, do you show your prices online or do you not show your prices online? And we do, but we hide them behind an information wall. So you've got to give us your a bit of information first of all. And the reason why we do this is because we are the most expensive, but um, it's like there's it's people out there don't understand self storage enough yet. Most people have never used self storage, so they don't understand that one self storage could be a leaky room that you know that is is it's terrible and your goods are going to get damaged there compared to an all singing, all dancing, you know, five-star hotel, seven-star hotel. And so we, what we want to do is we want to educate, not, not by tearing anybody else's building down or saying anything bad. We just want to say, look, we are self-storage association approved. Every single unit is alarmed because you never want to, I never want to win by, by saying that, that our competitors are bad because I just don't think it's, sends the right message. And so what we do is we, they come on the CR homepage. We've got some nice videos because most people don't understand self-storage. So we've got some nice videos explaining self-storage, how self-storage works. And instead of getting actors, I got one with my dad because it was a lot cheaper. So they're in it. They <laughs> cost me a couple of bottles of wine and, and the wife's on there as well. Um, pretend, well, she actually works there. So she's, she's working with them. And then hopefully we get them to request a quote and again, most people don't know what size unit they need. And so if they tell us roughly what they're doing, so we have little points of information that we request from them, then um, then we can give them a, 
a, a perfect quote that matches them. And so then we try to give somebody a call within 10 minutes. So when they, when they have a quote, we, we get it automated. It's automatic come through and put on our software. Again, we've, we built that ourselves to make sure because we don't want to spend the time inputting personal details into to the so- software. We, w- we want it to be as easy as possible for the, for the guys, for the, for the team. And we ring them within 10 minutes. And more often than not, the person on the other end of the line doesn't understand the storage. The first question is price. And it's not because they are, are talking about price and that's the only thing they're concerned about. It's because they don't understand storage. So that's the only thing that they understand. Um, so they, they start talking about the price. And what we want to gauge, first of all, with them is if they have requested the right size unit, because there's no point in selling somebody 100 square foot if you only need a 50 square foot. And so we try to gauge exactly what sort of stuff that they are putting in to their unit. And then we can give them a correct price on, on the correct unit. So, yeah, we give prices online. Um, but it's behind some information. So you've got to put in your email address or something like that. Brilliant. Okay. All right. Um, I'd love to carry on and on with this and maybe we'll come back and do another, another recording. Dean, there's so much value in that. I've really appreciate it. I've written loads of notes and then I stopped writing notes because I thought I'm just going to have to listen to this podcast a few times. <laughs> Jerry, can I just say one more thing? You yeah. mentioned multiples. I've got it just written down here. So Go on. multiples, yeah, in, in the UK at the minute for a leasehold, it's it's between eight and ten times. Wow. Um, but um what I always say is that the smaller the facility, then because they're for the big boys to, to swallow yeah. up. Um are the big boys were aren't interested in the smaller facilities at the minute. And so that's why that when I was looking at this other facility, it it, it was a small facility, it had um, around about 70 to 100 units. And the, re- the reason I'm being a bit vague is because some are little lockers, so I don't really yeah. include them. And so on that, yeah, them sort of facilities, I'm saying that it's three to five times. That's where I would value them at. Um, if you can obviously increase your, your amount of rooms you have, then then it becomes worth more as well. But yeah, the big boys are currently um, are saying that they're, they're paying between eight and 10 times multiple. And the great thing is it's all documented as well. Uh, with the Cell Storage Association, all the reports and stuff, we we get to see a lot of what goes on um, uh, and how much people are, are willing to spend. So yeah, eight and ten times multiple is. I, I, I've I've got um, so a mentor called Dan Bradbury, and he said, Dean, that can't be true because it doesn't doesn't work in any sort of business. And and then I, I said, I pointed him in, in America, their multiples are much higher. Yeah, they are. Said, yeah, and it's gonna it's gonna continue to explode because it's gonna be more people are gonna be fighting over prime locations and oh, you know. The, the 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 big boys safe store and big yellow they're they're going to be trying to buy you know independence as well just to make sure that they're the biggest and then you've got people from america starting to come in and then when i was in their mastermind um for self storage in america I, I was saying about the the prices that we was looking at and i said i saw i brought a deal to the table and every single person there said buy it buy it buy it <laughs> but they're they're judging it by the American standards of yep. what is right there and then, not for what we are right now. But yeah, the multiples are, are, are just phenomenal self storage. That's why I'm so I'm just I'm so excited about the whole industry. I think it's I think it's fantastic. Brilliant. All right, Dean. Thanks so much for all your time today. Um, people will definitely want to reach out to you. So can you just give us a couple of um, places they can find you and maybe tell us a little bit about your podcasts? that you, um, you work on as a self-storage one and you have another one that's been going for about a year now. Yeah, so um, you can get hold of me at deanbooty at iCloud.com. That's my personal email, B-O-O-T-Y at iCloud.com. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, Dean Booty. And um, my my podcast is called Hacking Self Storage. On a Monday, I give away everything that we've done in the past week. I tell you all about my conversions, my quotes, the revenue. I tell you everything um, just because... If somebody would have told me that, it'd have been really helpful at the time. I know I give too much away, and it's definitely bit me in the butt with competitors and stuff. But the more you give it, I just yeah, I, I enjoy it. It keeps me accountable as well. And then on the Thursday, we uh, we interview somebody in the industry or somebody wanting to come in the industry. Um, so yeah, that's hacking self storage. And then I have a podcast called Motivated Entrepreneurs. It's a daily podcast. I'm a big self-development junkie and I just try to, uh, it's it's really, it's a private message from my kids that I document um, what I learned. Um, some On a Monday, I'll tell you exactly what I'm trying to achieve this week and I'll tell you what's happened the previous week and then the rest of it, there's a book review and the rest of it's just takeaways that I've learned, maybe six minutes 
of uh, of what I consider golden nuggets. Whether my kids will ever listen to it, I don't, I don't know. But yeah, it's basically for my kids because I know that I would have loved that if I could listen to my dad going through you know the the trials and tribulations of, of business and life and stuff. So yeah, I'm just I'm just really honest and just tell everything. Some days I'm crying, some days I'm really happy. So yeah, check it out. <laughs> <laughs> awesome dean thanks so much uh today's been really good um i i think we will be coming back to talk about some more in depth so because there were so many threads there i wanted to pick up yeah, on that i had to resist you know so thanks very much dean um i will put your contact details in the show notes so people can find you there and i'm sure you'll be having a few more people tuning into your podcast i know that when we did our mini series it was really popular there was lots of questions coming out i think it's something tangible that people can get their hands around and, and see um how that how that could potentially work for them so it's been really good thank you if anyone um out there would like to contact dean i'll put the details in the show notes Thank you very much for tuning in. If you'd like to have any discussion or go into our Facebook group to talk about container storage, then you'll find us on the usual W's, facebook.com forward slash commercial property investor. In there, you'll find a little button to click to join the group, answer a couple of questions that are there, and we'll let you in and you ask any questions away in that forum as well. So thanks for all the reviews this week. It's been really um, great to see uh, how the podcast is helping people. I, I do find the whole review process really um, encouraging. And also it does help our numbers and it means we can get more guests, learn lots more about this industry and every little review is going to help. So thanks very much. And we look forward to speaking to you all again next week. 